lesson will be the final lesson in our series on Pure Monopoly. If you haven't watched the previous three lessons on Pure Monopoly, you should stop now, go back, and review those lessons before watching this final lesson. Today we're going to be talking about price discrimination. We're going to define price discrimination and explain how monopolistic firms or firms with market power can discriminate in the prices that they charge consumers based on several different characteristics. We'll distinguish between the three different degrees of price discrimination and we'll look at a monopolistic diagram to illustrate the effects of a perfectly price discriminating monopolist and see how it affects consumer and producer surplus, total welfare, and efficiency in the monopolistic market. So let's begin with a definition of price discrimination before we move on to the different types of price discrimination. Price discrimination refers to when a firm with market power charges different prices to consumers for an identical product. Now, the key term here is different prices to consumers for an identical product. There are three conditions necessary for price discrimination to occur. First of all, a firm must have market power. A perfectly competitive firm could not price discriminate. The reason for this is that a perfectly competitive firm is a price taker and must accept the price determined by the market. Secondly, the firms must be able to segregate the market between consumers with different willingnesses to pay or with different price elasticities of demand. Now, how can we price discriminate if we don't know what different consumers are willing to pay for a good? That's basically what this second prerequisite for price discrimination refers to. Thirdly, price discrimination requires that buyers of a particular good are not able to resell that good to other buyers who would otherwise have to pay a higher price. A classic example of this that I like to give is when a person books an airline ticket at a lower rate than somebody else booked that ticket for on the same flight. Of course, airlines prevent resale by requiring you to hold a passport that has the same name as the ticket that you carry to the gate. If you could resell a ticket that you bought at a lower price, this would prevent the airline from being able to charge different prices to different consumers. So these are the three conditions necessary for price discrimination to occur. If a firm has market power, is able to segregate the market based on the different willingnesses to pay among consumers and the different price elasticities of demand among consumers, and if resale is not possible from a consumer who paid a lower price to a consumer who might otherwise pay a higher price, then a firm may be able to price discriminate. Next, we're going to distinguish between the three different degrees of price discrimination that may occur. First, let's start with third degree price discrimination, and then we'll work our way up to first degree price discrimination, which is what we're going to examine graphically. Third degree price discrimination occurs between consumer groups. An example of this is a movie theater that charges different prices to people of different age groups. So for example, age groups may be a way that firms discriminate in the prices that they charge. Another way that firms may discriminate is time of purchase. A classic example of this is airlines that charge higher fares to consumers who book their tickets at the last minute than to those consumers who book their tickets weeks or months in advance. Second degree price discrimination occurs when firms discriminate the prices that they charge based on quantity. For example, bulk buying is a form of price discrimination in which buyers who order large quantities of a particular good will pay lower prices than buyers who order smaller quantities of those goods. Another example is deals such as two for one deals in which you buy two get one free. This is another example of price discrimination based on quantity. Generally the more you buy the less you pay per unit bulk buying and two-for-one deals, any example of where consumers pay a lower price because they bought more of a good is an example of price discrimination in the second degree. Now the final type of price discrimination is what we call first degree price discrimination. This is also known as perfect price discrimination. This is price discrimination by the individual consumer. If a firm can somehow determine exactly what each consumer is willing and able to pay for a good, then the firm would like to charge each consumer exactly what he or she is willing to pay. In this way, 
a firm can extract all the consumer surplus from consumers and each consumer will pay exactly what he's willing to pay, meaning that the firm charges different prices to each consumer based on his or her demand. This is why it's called perfect price discrimination. This is the most desirable form of price discrimination from the monopolist standpoint. If a firm could somehow determine exactly what each consumer is willing to pay and charge each consumer exactly that price, then understandably the firm would earn the highest level of revenues possible and the firm's profits would be maximized even though total consumer surplus would be reduced in the market. Since these video lessons are targeted at AP and IB economics students, we're going to focus on graphing this third form of price discrimination. While there are graphs for, this, for the second and third degrees of price discrimination, we're not going to examine those graphs today. Perfect price discrimination can easily be graphed using a demand, marginal revenue, and cost diagram such as that which we see on the left here. So let's look at our graph on the left and examine the price and quantity that a single price monopolist would produce at in order to maximize its profits. So we have explained in several videos now that the MC equals MR point represents the monopolist's profit maximizing quantity. Such a firm will charge a price corresponding with the demand for its product at the quantity of QM. So there's the monopolist's price, the single price monopolist's price and earn an area of economic profit which corresponds with that level of output and price. So the yellow rectangle represents our single price monopolist's economic profit at its profit maximizing quantity of QM. So what impact would the ability to price discriminate have on the monopolist's profits and the level of output that the monopolist would produce at? Essentially, perfect price discrimination allows a monopolist to charge different prices to every consumer that it sells its product to. Every individual consumer would pay exactly what he or she is willing to pay. So we can look at the demand curve as representing the marginal benefits of all the consumers in the market for this good. There are some consumers willing to pay a very high price. So up here, there are consumers who will pay the high price of P1. There are other consumers, in fact more consumers due to the inverse relationship between price and quantity demanded, willing to pay the price of P2. And in fact there are some consumers willing to pay the price somewhere between P1 and P2. So assuming this demand curve represents thousands of individual consumers, each with a different price that he or she is willing to pay, and that the monopolist can charge different prices to each of those consumers, there's actually going to be a whole range of prices that the monopolist charges. Representing each individual consumer in the market. So we can think of all the prices between P1 and P2 as being actual prices that, that the monopolist charges to different consumers. As we work our way down the demand curve, we can see the monopolist will continue to charge lower prices to additional consumers, but what's actually happening is that the marginal revenue that the monopolist is earning becomes the price that it sells additional units for. So in the end, the effect of perfect price discrimination is that the marginal revenue of the monopolist will equal the price that it charges each additional consumer. So we are in a situation where the demand curve also represents the marginal revenue curve. In essence, we have a demand and marginal revenue curve once again. Marginal revenue refers to the revenue earned for the sale of one additional unit. In the case of a perfect price discriminator, the monopolist will charge a different price to each additional consumer corresponding with his willingness and ability to pay, in other words, with his demand. So the question then becomes, at what quantity will the monopolist stop producing the good and at what price will it sell the good to to the last consumer? And now we can look at the profit maximization rule once again and see that the monopolist will wish to produce up to the point where MC equals MR. As we can see, the marginal revenue now equals the price that it sold the last unit for. So the result of perfect price discrimination is that the monopolist will produce at the quantity at which P equals MC. This, interestingly, is the socially optimal quantity. In other words, 
a perfectly price discriminated monopolist will be allocatively efficient. So what impact does the ability to perfectly price discriminate have on the price of the good and the quantity supplied? Well, the first part of that question is a little bit tricky to determine because there is no single price for the good. What we can determine is that the price that the last consumer will pay, the lowest price the firm would ever be willing to charge for its output, occurs where price equals marginal cost. So the last consumer, we'll call this PLC for the price the last consumer will pay, will be equal to the firm's marginal cost, indicating that the firm is now allocatively efficient. But what about the area of economic profits? A single price monopolist would earn economic profits equal to the yellow rectangle. But a price discriminating monopolist is charging different prices to every consumer. So the firm's ATC, since it's producing at Q, P equals MC down here, the firm's ATC is much closer to its minimum ATC. A firm producing at the quantity of Q, P equals MC will achieve an ATC much closer to the productively efficient level. So the firm's ATC will now be lower than the single price monopolist was. So the area of economic profit is simply the distance between all the different prices the monopolist is charging and the firm's ATC. Now graphically that's going to be the blue plus the yellow areas on a graph. So what is the outcome of perfect price discrimination by a monopolist? Well clearly there is much more economic profit the blue plus the yellow areas equal economic profit for the perfect price discriminator. What happens to consumer surplus? A single price monopolist, there was more consumer surplus as we can see. Everything above the price and below the demand curve, in other words the red triangle, represented consumer surplus under a single price monopoly. Under a perfectly price discriminating monopoly, there is no consumer surplus. However, there is more economic profit. And we can also see that there will be a greater level of output. Because the monopolist can continue to sell its output up to the quantity at which its marginal revenue equals its marginal cost, and now its marginal revenue is simply the price it sold its last unit for, a perfectly price discriminating firm will be allocatively efficient. This video defined price discrimination, discussed the three conditions necessary for a firm to price discriminate, and defined the three different degrees of price discrimination that a firm may practice. Now, which of these three degrees of price discrimination is actually most common in the world? Certainly, first degree price discrimination is not very common. It's very difficult for a firm to determine the exact price that each individual consumer is willing and able to pay. So first degree price discrimination is very difficult. Second and third degree are actually much more common. Second and third degree price discrimination, which is based on the quantity that you buy or by consumer groups such as age or gender or the time at which you purchase the product are very common. Second and third degree price discrimination, however, do not achieve the increase in allocative efficiency that perfect price discrimination in theory does achieve. However, on the other hand, less consumer surplus is transferred to firms under second and third degree price discrimination than it is under perfect price discrimination. So in conclusion, the effective price discrimination is threefold. Firstly, a greater quantity of output will be produced by a price discriminating monopolist than by a single price monopolist. Secondly, consumer surplus is transferred to the producers in the form of increased revenues and profits. And thirdly, there is less consumer surplus than there is under a single price monopolist. Is price discrimination good for society as a whole? That depends on the perspective you look at. From the monopolist standpoint, it is certainly more desirable. And from an efficiency standpoint, it is certainly more desirable. However, from a consumer standpoint, if you are one of the consumers that has to pay a higher price, then you certainly don't benefit from price discrimination. On the other hand, if you're someone who benefits from being able to be charged a lower price, then you benefit from price discrimination.